Guilhelmin Rezen. She is a child of the fourth generation of Rezen. Born in 1852, she later joined the congregation of the Grey Nuns and took the name of Sister Saint Jean l'Evangeliste. With her cousin, Guillaume Forbes, priest and bishop of Ottawa, she wrote a book on the Rezen family, Not Historique sur la famille Rezen. She also draws the genealogy of her family. Most of her writing comes from another book, Alice Baker's New England Captive Carried to Canada. Alice Baker even came to Oka looking for the trail of the captives who never returned to Deerfield. Also, Josiah Rising, the forgotten boy who never returned to Suffield, Connecticut. Seventeen o four. Philippe de Rigaud, Marquis of Vaudreuil and Governor of New France, gives the order to Jean Baptiste Hertel de Rouville, thirty five years old, to attack, massacre, and destroy the village of Deerfield, Mass. For this mission, de Rouville will need fifty Canadians from Boucherville, Chambly, Montréal, and Trois Rivières. He will also need Navy troops and militia. He will also bring 200 Indians from four different villages. For this mission, Jean-Baptiste Hertel de Rouville took with him 90 warriors from Kanawaki near Montreal, 60 Abenaki from Odanak near Sorel, 50 from La Mission de la Montagne in Montreal, and 30 Hurons from Lorette near Quebec City. Winter 1704, middle of February. All those people gathered at Fort Chambly and on snowshoes, pulling all their equipment with the bargains, are heading to Deerfield, Massachusetts, a distance of about 230 miles or 340 kilometers. At Deerfield, they had good reasons to be worried. They expected another massacre because the village was attacked seven times before. Deerfield, besides being the last village north of the United States, is also far and remote from the other cities and villages, was a prime target for an attack. The convoy headed south on frozen lakes and rivers. They are on snowshoes and dogs are pulling their toboggan. Near the future city of Brattleboro, they leave food, the dogs, and a few guards. They walk the rest of the way as fast as possible. Surprise attack is their most powerful weapon. Midnight. They can see the village. The soldiers load up their weapon. The Indians put on their war paint. They send the scout. The sentry is sleeping. At the village, all is quiet. At 4 o'clock. Some soldiers climb over the stockade and open the door. All the other attackers enter in the village. The guard wakes up, shoots a shot in the air to give the alarm. Too late. Suddenly, all hell breaks loose. The attackers are divided into small groups and start breaking doors and windows. They also burn the whole village to the ground. They kill all the people that they think will not be able to walk back the 340 kilometers 
or the 230 miles to Montreal. They also take with them anything of value, especially food that they will need on the way back. the house of Mary Mannionsdale, the doors and the windows are broken. The house is set on fire. The nephew of Mary Mann, Josie Arising, is a guest. He comes from Suffield, Connecticut. After the death of his mother, Josia was sent to Deerfield. He is taken captive by the Indians. Josia is the one that we're interested in. On the other side of the street, in the house of Godfrey Nims, all is burned to the ground. All the people are slaughtered except the mother, Mieta Belsmeed, and the baby of the family, Abigail. They are both taken captive. Abigail is the one we're interested in. 112 people are taken captive and brought to Canada by force. They will walk in the snow and the cold of March a distance of about 230 miles or 340 kilometers in three weeks for a total of about 16 kilometers a day. After the massacre, the captives are gathered together at the foothill of a small mountain on the other side of the Deerfield River. There, the Indian gives to the captive moccasin and snowshoes. Captivity is the business of the Indians. French Canadians don't bother with the captives. For the Indians, taking captives is in the tradition of the War of Mourning. In a battle, the first Indian who touches a captive becomes his master. So it is. All the Deerfield captives now have a master, and their survival will depend on his humor or goodwill. They are now heading back to Canada. After climbing the mountain, they take a last look at the ruins of their burning village. First break, the warriors and the French take care of their wounded. Suddenly, a newborn starts crying. He is immediately killed with a tomahawk blow. The first day, they will walk 8 kilometers or 5 miles. Walking in the snow is a new adventure for those people. They learn two important things. Always walk in a single file. Also, 
always walk in the footsteps in the person in front of you. The brakes must be brief. Cold weather is their worst enemy. Nightfall. The Indians build tents, make beds with spruce branches. The captives are tied down until morning. One of the captives, a young boy, manages to get away and heads back to Deerfield. The Indians tell the captive if another one of them runs away, they will all be burned. The second day is harder. The wife of Pastor John Williams, who gave birth six weeks ago, has a hard time keeping up with the group, who is going back to Canada very fast. She falls in the water while crossing a river. Unable to continue, her Indian master kills her with his axe. The fourth day, they are almost at the Connecticut River, where the soldiers and the Indians left some food for the trip back home. Anxious to get back, the convoy of more than 300 people increases the pace. Four women who are no longer able to keep up are killed by their Indian masters. Among those four women, Meetabel Smeed, Godfrey Nim's wife, the mother of Abigail. After walking in the snow and cold for 21 days, the convoy arrives at Fort Chambly in the province of Quebec. In Chambly, the captives were received by the people with dignity. They were able to settle temporarily in heated Canadian homes. They were also able to wash, change clothes, sleep in a real bed, eat a hot meal in a kitchen with forks and knives. After this break of a few days, they are back on the road again. After leaving Chambly, the convoy is divided. Captives that have an Abenaki master goes to Odanak near Sorel. Those one who have a master Huron goes to the Huron village near Quebec City. Abigail Nims will go to Montreal at La Mission de la Montagne. La Mission de la Montagne is situated in Montreal on Sherbrooke Street, west of Côte des Neiges. We can see the wall along with the two towers who were restored. À la claire fontaine, m'en allant promener, j'ai trouvé l'eau si belle que je m'y suis baigné. Del bon vent, del joli vent, del bon vent, la vue m'appelle. Del bon vent, del joli vent, del bon vent, ma vie m'attend. Bonsoir, mes amis, bonsoir. In 94, an Indian who drank too much, puts his shack on fire and all the village de la Mission de la Montagne is burned to the ground. At this point, the Sulpician priests decided to move their Indians away from the city and move the mission on the north side of Montreal at the Sault au Récollet near La Rivière des Prairies. Moving from la Mission de la Montagne to le Sault au Récollet will take about 10 years. In 1704, when baby Abigail arrived at the mission, the move to Le Sault au Récollet is almost finished. Abigail is four years old. Her mother was killed on the long way back to Canada. She survived this 230 miles or 340 kilometers, probably because her master carried her on his shoulder all the way. Now, he brings her to his shack and leaves her with Canastarzi, who is probably his wife or his mother. Starts now for Abigail, a long period of identity change. She will have to change her name, learn to speak French and Iroquois. She will have to change her religion, change her way of life, and integrate herself not in one, but two new cultures. June 15, 1704. Abigail Nims 
is baptized in the Catholic religion, official religion of New France. Her name of Abigail is changed for Mary Elizabeth in honor of her godmother, Mary Elizabeth Lamoine, daughter of Charles, Baron of Longueuil. But at the same time, this little girl who is under the protection of the Sulpician priest and the nobles of the French Canadian society is given to an Iroquois family who will name her Toato Gouache, which means she gets the water. This represents her rank in the shack. She is now a water girl. Josia Rising As we saw in the massacre, Josia was not from Deerfield, but from Suffield, Connecticut, and was a guest at the house of his uncle, Mehuman Insdale. It seems, young Josia did not go to La Mission de la Montagne, but was taken directly to Fowlaret at Le Sauré in the north of Montreal. We know very little about Fowlaret because this is where were taken most of the prisoners taken from the different skirmish attack and massacre in New England between 1687 and 1713. We think that after the British conquest in 1760 where the British took over Canada from the French the Sulpician priests destroyed some document related to Fowlaret because they did not want to upset the British. For Josia, 10 years old, adjustment must not have been easy. He had to learn the French and Iroquois language, accept the rituals and practices of the Catholic religion, and integrate himself fast to his new way of life. We don't exactly know how things went for him. But we have testimony of other boys of his age taken captive at Deerfield with him. Stephen Williams, 10 years old, told that the English boys taken at the Abeneki Reserve of Odanak near Sorel laughed at him in front of the Indians and make believe they did not knew English anymore, but they spoke English with him when they were alone together. Tuatu Gouache and Shuntakwani were not adopted by the family in which they were assigned. They both remain war captives capable of being sold or may be needed for prisoner exchange or they could get their freedom for peace talks. In everyday life they became household slaves. Since 1650 owning slaves were for Indians a sign of riches and prestige. The more, the merrier. Slaves were given the most boring chores. Little Tuato Gouache was assigned to get the water every day at the river. Shuntakwani him must have been sent to the fields. Here we have to understand that in the Iroquoian society, working in the fields was woman's work. English captives were light because they accepted to work in the fields. By the same token, those people were discredited and banned from the hunters. When they were with a hunting party, they were given women's work, like carrying the different package or bringing the game back to the village. For young Shantakwani, life must have been very hard. In the Iroquois society, assimilation was very important. The captives had to integrate themselves completely and as soon as possible, otherwise they would be subject to mockery, insult, and laughed at. Integration with the drastically unique Iroquois culture was daunting for a 12-year-old of English descent. Torn, stranded, and deprived of his true identity, he was forced to mature with the confine of his Josia rising, Ignace Rezen, and Shuantakwani personality. 1713 France and England signed the Utec Treaty, which ends their wars. It is now almost 10 years that Shuantakwani and Toto Gouache are captives. She is now 13 years old and him 19. They are now integrated in the hybrid mission of Fort Laurette. 
they were educated by the Sulpician priests and the sisters of La Congregation Notre Dame. They now speak French, but they also speak fluently Iroquois and are now assimilated to the Iroquois way of life. Now that the war is over between the French and the English means that the captives will be able to go back home. John Nims, Abigail's half-brother, comes to New France to offer a ransom for his sister. John was also a captive. At the age of 25, he was taken prisoner along with his half-brother Zebedia Williams, who was 29 years old. Both were kidnapped while working in the field. It was in October 1703, only a few months before the Deerfield Massacre. Both were brought to Montreal and had a very hard and severe captivity. Zebedia died in prison after two years, but John managed to escape with two other prisoners who were also taken on that raid. After 25 days of walking with hardly no food and no guide to help them, they were almost dead when they reached Deerfield. Now 35 years old and married to his adopted sister, Elizabeth Hull, Elizabeth was also taken captive in 1704, but was ransomed the next year. Finally, John left Deerfield, walked all 230 miles or 340 kilometers to Montreal to offer a ransom for his young sister, Abigail, but she refuses to go back home. I'd rather be a poor captive among the Catholics than to become a rich heiress among the Protestants. John Nims returns back to Deerfield empty-handed. Back in Montreal, the Sulpician priests, moved by Abigail's magnificent fate revelation, decided to intervene. They negotiate with her master and gets her liberated. They also negotiate the release of Josiah Rising Shuntakwani that nobody in Deerfield, Massachusetts or Suffield, Connecticut seems to be interested in. In 1715, Abigail Elizabeth Tuatogouash is 15. She is now free and able to get married. Josia Ignace Shuntakwani is 21. Elizabeth and Ignace both came from Deerfield. They were both taken in the same raid. They decided to get married. The ceremony takes place on July 29, 1715 in the chapel of Fallaret at Le Sous Recollet in Montreal. The new couple could have been able to establish themselves on a land in Montreal, like other captives who decided to stay in New France. Let's take for instance Matthias Farnsworth, who the Sulpician priest changed his name to Fanif. Matthias was taken captive in Groton, Massachusetts in August 1704. He finally decided to start a farm in Rivia de Prairie in the northeast of Montreal. But Ignace and Elizabeth decided to stay at the mission with the priests and the Indians whom with which they were raised. We have very few information on the first years of their marriage. Due to this fact, we think that the Sulpician priests destroyed documents because a lot of French married to Indians. At that time, New France became mythes, both genetically and culturally. In 1850, the Canadian government, with its new politics of trying to eliminate and completely assimilate both Métis and Indian to the European culture. For the French Canadians to keep their civil rights, the clergy thought it would be best to erase all traces of crossbreeding, and the historians invented purely European origins. 
it seems impossible to find the original document of the marriage of Ignaz and Elizabeth or the baptism of their children born at Le Sceau au Récollet. In some books of genealogy, it is written that their daughter Catherine would have been born on the 12th of May 1714, more than a year before the marriage of Ignace and Elizabeth. It is impossible to find the original document to confirm this date. For their son Simon, we found a birth certificate that indicates that the child was the son of Ignace Chantaquani and his legal wife Elizabeth Tuatogouache. On the other hand, we can read in the book La Paroisse de Champlain or Champlain's Parish, written by Father Cloutier, that Simon had the skin brown like an Indian. 1721. The King of France gives to the Sulpicians priest a 260 square mile land in Oka. It will be named La Seigneurie du Lac des Deux Montagnes. For this new seigneurie, the Sulpician will need a lot of manpower to clear the bushes, cut the trees, build the church, and a fort. But most of the manpower is on the island of Montreal, which is another seigneurie owned by the same priests. The only manpower available were the Indians of Le Sauvé The Sulpicians decided to close Le Sauvé and move the mission to Oka. The move is made in February because it is easier to walk on the frozen rivers in winter. The missionary and all the people of Fallaret, including Abigail Nims, Josia Rising and their three children starts walking the 30 miles or 45 kilometers to Woka. They have snowshoes and are pulling the toboggans. They bring everything with them. Even the little chapel is taken apart and carried on the snow. After crossing all the west end of the island of Montreal, they reach the village of saint anne de Bellevue. The caravan heads north on the lake of two mountains toward the final destination, the northwest bank of the lake, where they will find the new seigneury du lac des deux montagnes. The seigneury du lac des deux montagnes is a huge estate. The limits are saint eustache on the east side, saint andre d'Argenteuil on the west side, and from the banks of the lake of two mountains up to Saint Colombin to the north and Saint Jérôme on the northwest side. The living quarters of the new mission are built gradually. They first settle in the small bay west of the Snake River, after near the stream named Le Ruisseau de la Coulée. Today, this stream is named the Rezen Stream in honor of Josia Rising. But they soon realized that it would be better to be closer to the point. And it is at this place that in 1760, the priests start building a church, a dwelling for the missionaries, and a house for the employees. As for the Indians, they settle down each side of the church, each nation having their own quarters. On the east side, the Algonquin and the Nipissing, and on the west side, the Huron and the Iroquois. As for the Rezen family, with their hybrid status, not exactly European, nor exactly Indian, they obtained by the missionary a large estate about one and a half kilometer or one mile north of the village. This is where Ignace, Elizabeth and their children will be able to settle down. Ignace will build a log house for his family. We know that Abigail Nims died on the 3rd of January 1747 in the small house that she built with her husband Josiah Rising. She was not yet 47 years old. 
We don't know where she was buried, but we know that in those days they did not bury people in the winter. As for Josiah, after the death of Abigail, he never remarried. He died on the 3rd of December 1771 at the age of 77 years old. He was buried in the chapel in the village of Oka. This chapel does not exist anymore and we don't know where are his remains. Josiah, Abigail and her eight children all lived in this small house. Here is a brief expose of their children and their descendants. Anastasie Charlotte, she was first married to Jean-Baptiste Sabourin and her second marriage to Pierre Castonguay. Suzanne married Joseph Julien Chénier. Catherine marries Jean-Baptiste Séguin. Marianne marries Louis Séguin, the brother of Jean-Baptiste. Mary and Madeleine became nuns. Finally, the last child of Ignace Chantaquani and Elisabeth Toatogouache, Jean-Baptiste Jérôme, born in 1742, will be the one to carry on the Rezen's name. He marries in Oka in 1762, Mary Charlotte Sabourin. The mother of Mary Charlotte, Sarah Hansen, was also a captive but from another massacre that occurred in Knox March, Dover County in New Hampshire. Ignace Rezen, son of Jean-Baptiste Jérôme, is born on October the 8th, 1771, on the Rising Estate in Oka. He dies in 1849. He marries Claire Guindon Setawas. We know very little on Claire Guindon Setawas. In Indian, Setawas means like us. We think she was educated by the Indians or taken captives on another raid. We know that Ignace was a lieutenant colonel in a battalion in the Canadian Army. Like the Americans, the French Canadians were starting a rebellion against the British. Ignace refuses to read a proclamation issued by the British Governor Gosford. Ignace resigns his officer's commission and becomes a patriot. He had a very bad temper. One day, in a patriot's meeting, he left the group because he was not elected president. To crack down on this French-Canadian rebellion, in the month of November, the British officer, John Colborn, with his army of 8,000 men, burned down the old village of saint Eustache, including the church, the farms, the barns, and all the animals. The people had nothing left. Colborn even went 15 kilometers or 10 miles north of the village and personally burned Ignace Rezen's home in Saint Benoit. After Ignace, there will be four other generations to occupy Rising Land. Clet and his wife, Sophie Rose Gauthier, Jean Baptiste and his wife, Mélanie Mallette. Jean Baptiste and Mélanie will have four children. We are interested in two of them, Rising Rezen and his sister Wilhelmin, who will be the last one to occupy the Rising Estate before being evicted by the Sulpician priests. Those were the same priests who supposedly gave the land to Josiah Rising and Abigail Nims 232 years before. The Rezens were no longer welcome. What the priests wanted was the 65-acre land that the Rezens thought they owned for the past two centuries. Let's see about Rising Rezen and his sister Wilhelmine. In 1953, after the death of Rising, who by the way was never married, it's his sister Willen Min who became heiress of Risingland. Because she thought she was the owner of the estate, 
she sold it to the village of Oka. Since 232 years, the residents cleared the land, cut the trees, built the house, and paid the taxes. Big mistake. The priest decided to block the sale of the land and declared themselves owners of the estate. We are in 1953 in the province of Quebec, Canada, and the all-powerful Catholic Church has all the clout it needs for this seizure. The Sulpician went to Superior Court and with the help of the judge, Bernard Bourgeois, obtained a court judgment and seized Rising Land. Here are a few excerpts of the court judgment number 61063. This court, after studying the written case of the skillful attorneys, judges that the plaintiffs are justified to ask William Minrezen to clear out. This court declares that the plaintiffs, which are the Sulpician priests, were always and are still the only real owner of the estate. Order is given to Wilhelmine Rezen, widow of Adelaar Lacroix and not remarried, to clear out of the estate and let the plaintiffs who are the Sulpician priests. The free ownership and with no itch of any kind, and this in the 15 days of the notification of the present judgment. At this point, we can observe a few words, clear out in 15 days. This means that the Rezen family, after they lived in the house for 232 years, had 15 days to clear out. Of course, the Sulpician priest won the lawsuit and took the house from the Rezen. Wilhelmin, who was born and raised in the Rising Estate, was finally evicted by the Sulpician priests. She also lost the profit because she was unable to sell her house. She moved in Oka in a rented apartment. Rising land was deserted and abandoned during 20 years, from 1953 to 1973. In 1973, the Sulpicians sold the house to Mr. Mark Birube. Mr. Birubi, instead of demolishing the house, decided to renovate it, even though it was in an awful condition. After having started the renovations, he sold it to Mr. Yvon Beaubry, who continued to restore it. 2006. The owner, Mr. Yvon Beaupre, decided to plant a tree about 30 meters or 100 feet from the house. At this point, he makes a stunning discovery. While digging, he finds a human skull. The skull is brought in the house where it remains. Apparently, it is a woman's skull. At this point, we know that in 1747, there was an outbreak of measles or smallpox that decimated the mission of Oka. Due to the fact that we have no records of Abigail's death, or of her burial, it is possible that the skull that was found was Abigail's. Only more research by anthropologists will clarify this mystery. In the province of Quebec, the story of the rising estate is totally unknown. However, since 1886, several Americans came to Oka to visit the property. Knocking on the door of the small house and talking to the present owner who gives them a bit of information on the incredible odyssey of the rising estate. He informs them about the Indians, the Sulpician priests and the people who occupied the house since Josiah Rising and Abigail Nim. Here is a retrospective of some tourists who came to Oka to visit the small house. Alice Baker was the first tourist who came to visit in 1886. Alice left Deerfield, Massachusetts in a stagecoach on a train and finally by boat. 
She even wrote a book on the subject, True Stories of New England Captive Carried to Canada During the Old French and Indian War. In this book, she explains her trip and her visit to Oka. In 1889, while returning to Deerfield, Alice Baker brought with her a spruce tree taken on the rising estate in Oka. The tree was planted at the front corner of Memorial Hall Museum in Deerfield, in memory of the captives. The conifer remained on the site until it fell in a storm in September 1999. This photograph was taken by Frederick Nims in 1908. This photo of the rising house dates from 1908. We see Frederick Nims from Ohio with two descendants of Josiah and Abigail. Melanie Mallet Rezen, the wife of Jean Baptiste, and Wilhelmine Rezen, it is impossible to identify the fourth person. Again, Frederick Nims and Wilhelmine, as we saw earlier, she had 15 days to evacuate the house because the Sulpician priest took the house from the Rezen. Still at Rising Land, from left to right, Frédéric Nims, Mélanie Mallette Rezen, and the daughter of Mélanie, Wilhelmine. We can see the door of the dairy in the back. Wilhelmine, her sister Mary, and some guests from America. August 2004, Mrs. Rosemary Bellil and the Oka Historical Society gets from the provincial government the authorization to change the name of La Coulee Stream for the Rezen Stream. For this event, several Americans came from Deerfield to commemorate the 300th anniversary of the massacre. To end this documentary, let's see some photos of this event. In June 1969, the National Geographic had an article on the Deerfield Massacre by the French Canadians from the province of Quebec. In the next segment, you will see four pictures. On the first picture, Jean-Baptiste Hertel de Rouville is leading his troops. In the second picture, an Indian is breaking and burning a house. In the third picture, a rare artifact of a door from the massacre. We can clearly see on the door the hole made by a tomahawk. Finally, in the fourth picture, the convoy returns to Canada. They walk 340 kilometers or 230 miles in 21 days. From this prestigious magazine, written in the 1704 language, here is a brief resume of this article. With painted faces and hideous acclamations, Indians and French Canadians ravaged Deerfield in the 1704 massacre. As a sentinel dozed, the 340 attackers crept up drifted snowbanks to drop inside the stockade. The enemy came in like a flood upon us, Parson John Williams recalled of the carnage. 
A shouting Frenchman directs frenzied Indians as they herd their captives, the parson, and many women and children among them. A savage drags plunder from the frere house. Another guzzles looted rum, while down the street a group pushes a flaming cart toward a doomed home. The front door of the Sheldon house behind the steepled meeting house barred the savages. But they broke in the rear and tradition says dashed out the brain of the Sheldon two-year-old daughter. Smoke sent a grim message to nearby settlements. When rescuers arrived, much of the village lay in ruins. Its survivors, some of whom had fled barefoot over frozen fields, counted 49 dead and 109 others carried off on a forced march to Canada. September 2009, my wife Lili Pero and I were invited by the Suffield Historical Society of Connecticut, the birthplace of Josiah Rising, to show our video. 2009, the anthropologists of the University of Massachusetts, while digging, find the original foundation of the Nims House dating before the 1704 massacre. This is the house where was living Abigail Nims. Adieu mon passé, ma belle enfance. Adieu souvenir de mon beau pays. Là-bas déjà le printemps recommence. Qu'il est loin le soleil de l'exil. Il est loin le soleil de l'espoir Mon Dieu, rendez-moi ma tendre enfance Le bord de la mer, mes jardins fleuris Et si l'hiver déjà recommence Qu'il est long le chemin de l'ouvrir Chemin de l'amour. J'ai envie d'être heureuse, mais me voilà amère. Mon Dieu, rendez-moi les parfums de la mer. Je désespère de vivre dans ce pays trop grand. Mon Dieu, rendez-moi le bonheur de l'enfant. Laissez-moi rêver jusqu'à la fin avril. En mai ici, la vie recommence Qu'il est long le chemin de l'exil Qu'il est long le chemin de l'oubli Non, non, je change 